Hi, everyone. Sheila Butler with Successful Women Talk. Want to say thank you so much for joining me today. And today on the show, I have Dixie Gillespie. Now, she has been called a muse, an alchemist, a blast through artist, but she's also been called and known as Dynamite. So she has a new book out. She's the author of Just Blow It Up. I'm sorry, I'm reading this. Firepower for Living an, Alt, an Unlimited Life and a companion book, Doses for Dynamite firepower for capturing the inspiration in everyday things. I can't wait for you to learn more about her story. So welcome, Dixie. Well, thank you, Sheila. I'm, I'm so tickled to be doing this with you. Well, Looking I, forward to it. I am so excited. We played, not that everybody else knows this, we talked about this, and we've played back and forth email tag, and we are finally here, and I am just really excited to, to get your story. And then a lot of people know about you, but I was really excited to share your story with, with my community. So thank you again. Thank you. Case of two determined women. Nothing was going to stop us from doing this. <laughs> we are doing this no matter what. That's right. That's well, right. Listen, you know, I kind of like, people like to know a little bit of background story. So we're all, we all like to feel like we know somebody and we meet people online and, and we read their story. But why don't you give us a little bit of history about yourself and kind of how that got you to where you are today? Oh, most of it's accident <laughs> after accident, if you believe in accidents, which I don't. You know, it's kind of yeah. funny. I always said there's no, no such thing as coincidence. And my friend Richard Bach says there's a whole principle of coincidence. Either <laughs> way you look at it, you know, you, you got to pay attention to those accidents, to those coincidences, right? Right. So I originally intended, well, I was I was going to be a drama coach. Yeah. Ah. Um, I and, and not because I really love the stage. I'd already gotten kind of bored with being on stage, but I like to direct. What does that tell you about me, right? <laughs> um, but I love to coach. I love to see people, you know, kind of come out of whatever fear or inhibitions they were having and kind of step into their own. So I was going to be a drama coach. And I, and I look back at what I was like when I was in, in theater and drama class. I'm like, really? You wanted a whole classroom of those people? What were you thinking? But that was my plan. And uh, my, my father actually had, had developed process cancer when I was still in high school. It came back on the bone. So I went home, nursed him. I came back with the, I'm going to go back to school. And I don't know, drama seemed a little trivial at that point in my life. And I needed to make a living. I'd been without income for a while. And so I, I went to work for an accounting firm. I'm, I don't belong in an accounting firm. That was, that was an accident. But basically I walked into a temp agency and I said, I need temp work. I want to go back to school. What do you want to do? I don't know yet. You know, I was definitely in this. I haven't figured out my passion purpose thing at this point. I just know I'm not going to be a drama coach. I'm, I'm pretty sure about just this. Not doing that. And I'm not going to work in an accounting office. So two, two little eliminations. <laughs> they said, well, you go out and interview with this dentist. He's, he's contracted us to find him an office manager. We know you don't want a full-time job, but go make us look good. Shoot. Okay. <laughs> so I go have a two-hour conversation, great conversation. wasn't really an interview. I get home, the phone's ringing. And uh, it, it, he says, Dixie, this is Pete. There's something I forgot to ask you. I said, sure, Pete. What was that? He said, will you go to work for me? I said, sure. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Because I had nothing better to do with my life. I don't, you know. So I actually went into, and I knew nothing about dentistry. I mean, I didn't even know that a cleaning was called a prophylaxis. So I go through training, and they're like, hit F8, and we'll charge out a profi. And I'm like, F8, I got. Profi? What? What, what? Does that what? Mean? what? Yeah. Right. So I managed his office for a little under six years, um, more than doubled it. I mean, it was just an incredible experience. He was he was a wonderful mentor for me. And then the next accident, because that was a total accident, the next accident was getting into healthcare consulting. It seemed like a natural stepping off point. Looking back, I'm like a consultant, really? But <laughs> I did I did that for a lot of years and kind of reached um, a nice a nice level of success and beautiful. I, I, I look back and I'm a little, little impressed with myself in <laughs> retrospective, yeah. but I, I, that was so accidental and it was such a wonderful training process. I mean, it was kind of MBA in a box and, you know, getting into organization, organizational development, but they didn't want me in personal development. I was definitely drawn to the personal development side and that was not where this company wanted me to be. And so I literally kind of, came to my senses at a funeral. I, I was sitting at a funeral. It's, it's one of the things that I talk about and just blow it up was, was this realization that this guy's 10 years older than I am, died with no warning unexpectedly. They went to find him, you know, dead that morning. And uh, it was, it was this big, if that happened to you in 10 years, what, yeah. <laughs> you know, what, what do you have to show for your life? What would they say about you? And I realized that there was this, that little light, you know, I think of a passion as that flame inside <laughs> was pretty much dead. And so I went off in the direction of, of personal development, which took me into coaching and took me right back to the roots of never, never accepting can't 
You know, even as a little tyke, somebody would say, you can't do that. And I'd say, I can too. Just watch me. <laughs> and, and there was no better way to get me to do anything than, than to tell me it wasn't possible for me. And uh, so coaching has taken me right back there. I love that. Full circle. That's right. That's right. And I, I want to touch on this a little bit more because you talked a little bit about you don't believe in accidents. Like things are really supposed to happen. And, and you know, before I kind of thought, oh, well, it just happened. But you know, over the last three or four years, I have decided just because of the situations that I've been put in that people are put in my life at the right moment. Or you have to, like you said, you have to be open-minded to it. Maybe those people were always there, but I wasn't as aware and open-minded and go, oh my goodness, this really was supposed to happen. Yeah, you know, some people see supposed to as, you know, the external divine, um, you know, in your life. There's, there are a lot of ways to experience this nothing is an accident part. But the way I look at it, Sheila, is, you know, I, I'm in control of my life. You know, the, there's always this this human element where we think we're not in control because we're just a human. Yeah, we're, we're just human. But the truth is we all have a spiritual self. And that spiritual divine self, whether we, you know, perceive it as an external channel, an internal channel, whatever it is, that's acting on our behalf as well. And so I don't think of supposed to as preordained or destined. I, I'm not a big believer in, in destiny or, or fate. So much as I am, I know that I have a higher connection uh, within me that knows why I'm really here. You know, my human self is a little <laughs> clueless. You know, I, I kind of agreed to that by being human, right? That I would pretend to be a little clueless. But there's that other part that isn't clueless and that knows what my purpose is and kind of knows what I'm on this journey for and that that self draws things in or becomes aware of things that otherwise wouldn't have meaning so it's more like finding the gifts in the experience or the gifts in the relationship or the gifts in in anything it's the gifts in the accident not the was it supposed to be or not supposed to be you find the gifts you need in order to accomplish what you're here to accomplish I think I totally agree Okay, Paul, I'm going to pause one second. I'm going to sure. take, I will cut this little part out, but I want to turn off my notifications because it's going to drive me crazy. <laughs> Sorry, I should have already done this. Sorry about that. No worries. There we go. All right, so now what I will do is I'm going to put that, my hand up again. That, when I'm editing, that helps me. Yeah, it gives you a little silence. I <laughs> it say. really does. Okay, so I love that you said that because I have always been, um, I was in the medical field for many years. That was the first part of my career. And then so and then I got into business. So I went to, to get my MBA and I got into business by accident. And we'll call it right. an accident. And then I grew, uh, I had a co-founder. We helped grow, uh, had a very successful business, sold that a few years ago. I've always been very, very business driven. So uh, you know, some, someone said one day, you were, you were somebody that always has your ducks in a row. And I do agree with that, but I've never got into the, I will call it the woo-woo side of me. So more of the personal development side, although I read a lot of business books, but recently somehow I have in my mastermind group, I have a friend that's very woo-woo, very business, but very woo-woo. Right. And she's, she's very realistic about it. So she's helping me realize the other side of things that I really have now figured out that I'm missing this part that I have put off because it wasn't as... That's not what people want. They don't want to know the personal side of me. They want to know the business side. It's kind of amazing when you get into, um, you get those things kind of aligned. It's funny how that's playing a big part in my life right now. Oh, we have so, we have so many parallels in what you just <laughs> said, because as a consultant, you know, I always call it the Navy blue suit years. You know, if you read Just Blow It Up, you'll find yeah. this little section on the, the Navy blue suits and how Navy blue suits don't suit me. That was, that was so not me, but it was a part of me I needed to explore, right? Because yes. as a child, I was, I was very drawn to the idea that there's more to us than the corporal body. And what was that connection? And I was raised in what was basically a Christian cult. I mean, it was very secretive, not even registered with the government, you know, very <laughs> under the radar. We met in homes, not churches. So I was I was raised with a strong tie to spirituality, but within this box. So I had a box for my spirituality. I was supposed to experience it within this box. I don't do well with boxes. <laughs> I don't any boxes. Kind, right? I don't even understand the concept of a box. So you know, I, I, as a child, I like to explore how other people experience their spiritual nature. And then I got into business and oh my, you were not supposed to go there. Yeah. That's good. You know, that's fuzzy management. That's, that's right. That's woo -woo. <laughs> that has no place in business. And yet I observed that the most successful people in business or anywhere else 
were the people who brought literally the spirit of what they wanted to accomplish into their work. You know, they, they didn't necessarily bring faith or religion into their work, but they were there, you know, body, mind, and spirit. Yep. And I thought, we're leaving <laughs> this, you know, we got the body, mind thing going on, and I'm training the heck out of everybody's body, mind. Or is the spirit? Yeah. Because that's where energy comes from. You know, yeah. ultimately, it's that, that passion, that desire, that purpose, that inner motivation and connection that drives our, our, our energy. And that comes from a place of spirit. So if we don't connect with that, it's just work. And yet I'm not yeah. really any more into just work <laughs> than I am boxes. It's just that's just not fun. I agree. I love that. You know, I want to ask you real quickly, because you touched a little bit on your childhood. How did you, and we won't get into the, the people can read about it. Well, you, I know you've talked about that a lot recently, right. but how do you break out of that box? So, because if you're, you're an only child, right, and you were raised in kind of a very strict cult, like what you call a cult-like religion, how did you get out of that? Because so many people can't. They are still, they stay in that box. How yeah. did you get beyond that? Or they get outside the box and they feel very alone. Yeah, they know what to do. They, they knew what to do in the box and all their connections were in the box. Yeah. And the weird thing for me was I'm actually not an only child. I had a brother and sister that were 16 oh. and 17 when I came along. That's right. You were 16 years different. So that's what Yeah. It was. So I was raised as an only child. I mean, they were more like an aunt and uncle. And, gotcha. and you know, not that they weren't family, but they weren't like siblings to me. There was no way that that yeah. could happen. And my father had not come into this religion when they were growing up. So they had one parent in, one parent out. So, you know, they got a little, maybe a different perspective of the world and what's right and wrong. For me, you know, like my my siblings listened to secular music. They had recorded music. That wasn't, I wasn't supposed to go there, you know. People said, you can't do that. And I was like, yeah, I'll find a way. Um, music <laughs> is one thing can. you can't keep out of my life. But um, so that was a, a weird perspective. Then, of course, there was the generational gap. So my parents were older. What was not appropriate to them, even from outside of the faith, was suddenly very much okay with my generation. And that was really hard for them to accept. So there were just cants everywhere. And to tell you the truth, Sheila, I think that was a favor okay. because it was so over the top. You know, my box was so constricting that uh, most people couldn't have lived inside this little tiny box. <laughs> most people's boxes is a little more acceptable, manageable, so they don't fight it as hard, right? right? So I think in a way that was a favor. I fought like crazy because it was so confining. And and so I think the first thing is to understand you're in a box, right? I, I understood I was in a box. I was constantly told, no, you can't do that. You can't wear your hair down. You can't, you can't wear jeans. You can't, you can't, you can't. And I knew that was, that was unreasonable. That, yes. that, so it was obvious to me I was in a box and I wanted out. Most people, the size of their box is just comfortable enough <laughs> that they'll stay in it. So the first step is to realize that you are bigger than your box. You, you need to be bigger than your box in order to live a fulfill, fulfilled life. So recognizing the box, step number one. And then the next thing that happens is, you know, for a lot of kids raised the way that I was raised, they want to do everything that was outside the box. And they just kind of go a little crazy. <laughs> I really, I kind of credit Richard Bach's book, Illusions, with my not quite going there. Um, but it was still kind of this balancing act of what do I really want? I've wanted all these things that were off limits. What do I want badly enough to do it? What's smart? What's not smart? Now that I've said I can do anything, you know, I can do anything, but there are probably things I shouldn't do. They're not my best interest. <laughs> so it's figuring that out. So the next thing I always tell people is, you know, you, you don't accept can't, but don't pursue everything just because somebody threw up a brick wall. I did that. It was a, it was a phenomenal waste of energy. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I've already proven that one yeah. for you. You don't have to go there. Do not go recreate the will. She's That's telling right. you right here. That's right. <laughs> Unless you want to, you know, do it and write your own book, in which case, you know, call me and let me know how it goes. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it was a phenomenal waste of energy. Just everything that somebody said I couldn't do, I was like, yeah, you want to bet. I mean, I ended up with frostbite one time because I was told it was too cold to go ride a horse. <laughs> and I'd been seriously thinking that myself, but the minute somebody said it was too cold, you'd never be able to stand it. Yeah, I, I'm... I'm in, the, in yeah. the saddle, right? And it was frostbite. So don't do that. The, so it's connecting to what you do want that was outside the box. And I think that that connection to true desire is what we leave out when we leave the spirit side out of business. Yes. Because we say this is the right thing to do for the business. Well, yes, but does it serve you? 
and nobody asked that. That's actually why I left the consulting company I was with. Yeah. They wanted textbook cookie cutter management and their practices weren't performing as well as my practices were because I was going to the doctor and saying, what do you want? Uh, and yeah. then my, my doctors <laughs> would pursue it. They would really go for it. And the ones that were getting cookie cutter, this will work and you should do it because it will generate more income. weren't doing it. Yeah. I love that. And you know, when we say box and we're talking about, you had to break out of that from your childhood, but this could be anyone where we could talk about a woman that's married, a mother. She wants more than just that. I know some people are afraid to admit that, but you know, we, some of us do. I love being a mom, but I want more. I want to also have a career. I want to help people. It could be that box. It could be the, hey, you're a woman, you can't do that. Hey, you're a mom, you can't do that. Hey, you can. Don't take can't. Uh, I mean, like you said, you've tried, you try to help people eliminate that word from their vocabulary. Right. And, you know, the, the box goes the other way, too, because there's this whole box that says if you're going to be a professional woman, if you're going to, you know, be a high level, you know, C-level, director level employee or a successful entrepreneur, you're going to sacrifice being a mom. It's not OK to to have children in your life now because you you've got to play by their rules. And I don't take that can't very well either. <laughs> you know, I, yeah. rules, you know, what rules you decide the rules based on what you need in your life. And so we have all these, um, and, and they're so confining. We have all these things we identify with. I identify as a woman. I identify as a professional woman, or I identify as, a, you know, a domestic woman. Or it's it's all this either or. There's no either or, guys. Yeah. It's it's whatever combination you choose. I agree. I, I believe to say that, that you can have it all. You just have to define what your all is. That's, so you can have all that you want. All that you yeah. want. Yeah, exactly. I love that. Well, let's talk a little bit about your book. So you wrote a book, and I, I think I heard or read somewhere that you, you never thought you would be an author. So how yeah. was that writing process for you? How long did it take? How hard was it? Or did it just kind of flow once you got started? Yes, yes. Yeah, you know, I love it. Yes. <laughs> Ask me that question on any different day. It's so funny. <laughs> and, you know, I, I never really thought you know, everybody says, well, you love to write, you love, you know, love to read. I grew up with no television, no radio, none of that. So books, I mean, that was where I got story. And if I have an addiction, it's definitely an addiction to story. I love story. Um, and so why didn't you want to write a book? And I'm like, oh, no, it wasn't that I didn't want to. It's I assumed I never would because I have a really high standard. So I read some amazing, amazing authors, fiction and nonfiction, and the idea that I would ever step into that world just seemed arrogant, presumptuous. Um, after Richard Bach and I started a conversation, I once, you know, wrote something to him, shared something, I don't know what it was, and he said, thank goodness you've got a day job, you'll never be a writer, and then he went on to compliment what I said. Well, I skimmed the email, ran off thinking, well, you just got told, but don't be surprised, you knew this, and I come back and send him a, you don't have to worry about hurting my feelings, and he says, okay, wait a minute, you, you, you know, you missed the point. And so I told him I always thought I'd be a writer with a, a little W, you know, blog posts, articles. Yeah. I'd, I'd been published in, you know, things like dental economics, nationwide journals. But that wasn't writing to me that, right. you know, that articles were different. It was work. So I didn't I didn't think I'd ever write a book because my standards were so high. I'd never share it with anybody. And everybody said, you got to have that free download. You know how people say you got to you got to. Well, I caved to that one. Okay. You can't and you got to. You can't, you gotta, you should, you must. <laughs> right. Yeah, all these these extreme absolutes. Yeah, but exactly. I caved to that one and I thought, you know, it is it is true. I want to offer some value for free and connect with people. So I did the typical ebook, you know, newsletter sign up thing. And the ebook I wrote was a little thing called Anatomy of a Brick Wall. And it was breaking down those four types of walls, those I can't because statements, and the process that I use in coaching to to break through them. And it turned out to be longer than I expected because, boy, once I got started, I found out I had a lot to say. <laughs> but I put that out there, did not really think much about it. And then two things happened. One, that's how Richard Bach and I actually connected. He downloaded it, read it, sent me a tweet. <laughs> Weird. but Not an accident. No accidents. <laughs> as, you know, as he wrote a book called Nothing by Chance, and that's, that's the inside joke, right? Nothing yeah. by Chance. And then the other thing was I connected with uh, the guy who was then in charge of, of Sound Wisdom, my publisher, and has moved into their parent company as, as president. But Nathan was at an event that I uh, was spoke at and then sponsored one of my events. And he said, you know, when are you going to write a book? And, uh, you know, I suppose I got it. You know, somebody's going to tell me I got to write a book. I got it. 
<laughs> or you <laughs> Eventually, <can. laughs> I'll do it. But I intended to self-publish. Scott Ginsburg's a good friend of mine. He right. self-published with a team here in town. I was like, okay, I'll do it when I get around to it. Yes, I, I know I, I got to, but I'll self-publish. And Nathan just very quietly kept at me to take that ebook and turn it into a full length book. So the writing process, by the time I realized I'm going to write a book, I'm, I'm really going to like <laughs> write a book for a publisher kind of thing. It was, it was partially written. Um, I had, you know, Richard in my corner, which is no small thing. And he gave me the best advice I, I have ever heard. And he got half of it from Ray Bradbury. So he had reached out to Ray Bradbury. He was a big, big hero of his and said, okay, what do I need to do about writing a book? And Ray said, write a thousand words a day, and it doesn't matter if they're good or not. You just set yourself a standard of a thousand words a day. Some days they will not be good, and some days they'll be so good you'll, you won't believe you wrote them, but write a thousand words a day. Okay, so that was step number one. Richard added to that, you write, you don't edit. You never edit and write in the same pass. And his thing that saved me, because I'm a collaborative person, I, <laughs> I have my mastermind, I believe in the power of, of, you know, adding other people's thoughts. We don't do anything alone. It's impossible to do anything alone. It's always rooted in a shared experience. I love that. But, you know, he said, don't share it with anybody until you're ready to defend it with your life. Ah. And so I didn't. That was the hardest part of writing this book. <laughs> because you until, want that support also, oh, right? You're like, oh. I want the feedback. Actually, I'd like for somebody to tear it apart and tell me what yeah. I did wrong, you know? And he said, no, even if they're complimentary and mean it, if, they're, if their advice is dead on and, and makes it better, you don't share it until you're ready to defend it with your life. And oh my gosh. So thousand words a day, never edit and write in the same pass. And the hardest one, keep it to yourself until you're sure you've done the most with it that you can. I love that. Oh, that, that's great. Now, are, you have another book in you? Or two, oh, or? <laughs> you know, the dam is broke now, Sheila. It's, it's your You know, absolutely. Now, Doses of Dynamite is actually a devotional quotation book of some of the more thought-provoking quotes from Just Blow It Up. So it's really kind of you read Just Blow It Up and then you take that and you do your own work because, you know, all those quotes came out of what I did with it. But it's not meant to be telling you how to do something. It's telling you how I did it so you can figure out how you do it. So the quote book is very much for you to sit down and do your own work with these concepts. Um, I don't really think of that as a separate book. It's almost like a work book. It's just prettier because it's a gorgeous, <laughs> gorgeous book. The photography is beautiful. It's not mine. So I can say that. The next book, well, I, I actually have another book written. It's a fiction book, um, eh, partially fiction, that draws from childhood experiences oh. and the healing process, and that has not been submitted. I, I'm i still at the um, not ready to defend it with my life. I was about life. to say, not, you're not totally ready to defend that yet, are you? <laughs> That's right. Here. That's right. <laughs> Although, you know, it's it, it's gotten some high praise from people that matter, but, but not ready with that one. Um, and I'm looking at doing some joint books with some other experts, and then the next book for me, um, will probably be the work around connecting passion, purpose, and presence. Ah. Um, because so many of us get lost in this, what is my passion, what is my purpose, but we never figure out how to externalize it and make a business out of it. You know, people say, I'm passionate about it, I don't know how to make a living at it. Right. If it has value, you can make a living at it. It's really that simple. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because I guess we just take those, like our skill sets for granted. Like I had a very successful offline business and then when I sold that, I wanted to start an online business. I knew nothing about SEO, keyword research, online marketing, nothing. Right. And I just took all of my skill sets from running a very successful business. I just took it for granted. And then one day I was talking with someone. They're like, no, you don't get it. People don't understand that part of business. Right. And I was like, oh, well, I really never thought of it that way. But I never thought about make now. Now I do a lot of consulting around it. And it's very helpful for people. But I'm glad someone said that to me because it is valuable. We just don't sometimes, like women, we don't toot our own horn enough. Sometimes we don't take enough value in those skill sets that we have. Right. We don't toot our horn because we don't even see that we've done anything that's tootable, so to speak. Good point. You know, <laughs> we're so busy figuring out what we need to do next or, or where the gaps are that a lot of times we don't, you know, it, when I started over, I, I looked at two things. One was, what, a, what am I most proud of? And I always tell people, don't just take what are you proud of in your career. I looked at my personal relationships, my volunteer work, um, casual conversations. You know, what, what could I say, oh, it felt good to be part of that. So yeah. I always tell people purpose. The biggest clue that you have about your purpose is the outcomes that light your fire. 
Right. So when you've helped to achieve an outcome, whether you were paid for it or not, and that little fire inside goes, woo, I yeah. want to be part of that again. I want to like do that, that again. Oh my gosh, yeah. I want to, you know, there's a good clue about your true core purpose yeah. Yeah. here. And so that, that was the first thing I did. And I realized everything I was, I was wanting to be part of again was somebody doing something they'd never been able to do or they thought they couldn't do or doing something better than they'd ever done it. Um, figuring out their own way of doing it, you know, when they constantly compared themselves to other people and said, I can't do it as well as, because they were trying to imitate right. instead of just do the, their own way. All of my accomplishments fell into that bucket, so to speak. I was like, oh, I'm definitely in the wrong part of my industry here. <laughs> you know, this consulting thing, and I still do a lot of consulting with my clients. That comes in, but we coach first. We get through the mindset stuff, and then we get into strategy and know-how. So that was a big clue. And then the other thing I tell people to do is category, you know, inventory, and, and, and create buckets of all of your success stories for the success factors that went into creating them. What did you have to know, be, or do in order to make that happen? Because there's your true strengths. You know, there's right. a... A clip of an, an interview that I did with Scott Ginsburg somewhere, it's floating around somewhere that he, he was doing a presentation. He brought me up afterward. We talked about starting over because I've started over many times. And I always say you never start over with nothing so long as you have yourself. And the key thing, wow. as you say, is you got to know what value yourself has. Yeah, and, and and have that strength and and be able to look deep because I remember like when I sold my company, it wasn't, I didn't sell it intentionally. Um, so I, it was a very traumatic experience for me. And I was like, you know, what do I do? I was a healthcare professional for 15 or 16 years. Then I reinvented myself as a business owner. And then that was my identity. And then that was taken from me. So then what do I, what am I now? What do I do now? I was very depressed. It was, ter it was a terrible time for me. And it took me a bit to go, I do the same thing I've done from the beginning. I love helping people. Right. But I didn't realize that. You know, I've, I've done a lot of forums, you know, questions and ask people, what are you passionate about? 99% of the time, the answer starts with, I am passionate about helping people. And then, you know, my question is always helping pe which people do what, do what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, Who and what? what, what yeah. group of people and what are you helping them do? And more to the point, you know, when it comes to value, Sheila, is what changes for them because you help them do it. Yep. You know, we're, that's that's the core of the true value. And that's why I say you, you can make a business at anything, because if you can answer that question of this group of people, I help them do this. And this is how it transformed their life. Yep. Anybody will pay for transformation, right? That's right. I love it. Yep. I want to ask you one more thing. I heard you say somewhere uh, the term attitude determines your altitude, and I loved that. You know, that's not original. I'm sure other people have said it. It actually happened because of Richard Bach. He was explaining, you know, he's, he's an aviator as much as an author, and he was explaining that when you're flying, the direction the nose of the plane is pointing is called your attitude. So if the if the nose of the plane is pointing up or down or neutral, that's your attitude. And it, I suddenly realized attitude determines your altitude. If your if your attitude is this way, yeah, your altitude is going to go that way too. Love right? that analogy. And if your attitude is so, it's no different. You know, you make the adjustment on the stick, so to speak. You pull back on the yoke. You you've got to notice. And again, it's back to that awareness. You got to know you're in a box. You got to know that it's your attitude that's that's bringing you know the nose of the, the plane, so to speak. It's changing your direction, um, and you got to make those adjustments. But absolutely, attitude and perspective. I always say, you know, it's not about the events of our story. People want to know, okay, how did you get to where you are? It's not a chronological, this happened and then this happened and this happened. Because that makes it sound like things happened to me. <laughs> right. You know, it's it, how did you interpret it? Not just what did you decide to do about it, but how did you interpret it? How? What's your perspective on it? What's your attitude toward it? And what are you focusing on? You know, it's like the rose bush thing, right? If you're <laughs> focused on the rose, all you see is the rose. And those thorns are really surprising. Then. Yeah. It's like, whoa, I, I thought this was just a rose. And if you shift your focus and it's just on this cane of thorns, then life looks really ugly and scary and you forget about the thorns. You, I mean, about the rose. you got to back up and see the whole rose bush for what it is yeah. and just enjoy it the way it comes. And just deal with, uh, you know, life is certainly uncertain. And, you know, I think once I've let go of that and realized that, you know, it just is. 
and be more aware. Be present, be aware, and know that it's uncertain and, and, and move with it. Yeah, and know that everybody's life is uncertain. And yeah. it's not the times. I was asked in, in a, a conference one time I'd finished, and he said, you know, one thing I think you can answer for the audience, because it's all entrepreneurs, and he said, I think, you know, in these uncertain times, people deal with a lot of fear. And I said, there are two things there I want to address. One is these uncertain times. I have never lived in certain <laughs> times, and I'm certain I never will. So get used to it. Yep. And two, fear is nothing new either. You know, fear is not a result of, you know, uncertainty or the unknown. Fear is about feeling unprepared. So, yep. you know, it's, it's again, centering back on your own value, knowing that, that you have strengths, you have, you know, uh, priceless qualities, you have gifts. And so life's uncertain. It is. You'll be prepared. I think I'm liking it uncertain a little bit better every day. I'm be yeah. I like that. Hey, Dixie, if someone wanted to connect with you, where would you want to send them? You know, there, there are a couple of, of good places to connect. If they're interested in the book, they would go to justblowitupbook.com and they can download the first seven chapters and, and watch a fun little video that actually has some childhood pictures that, that I look back and I think, wow, you were a cute kid. Um, too bad <laughs> you had so much so, trouble. Right? You so bad for yourself. <laughs> that's right. Um, so it, it's a fun little thing and you can get seven chapters. And if they just want to connect through the book, that's the best place to do it. Um, of course, social media is always a good place to connect. Facebook is kind of home away from home. That's where all my pen pals live. So it's, <laughs> it's a it's a good spot to connect. And then just generally, my website is DixieDynamiteCoaching.com. I love that. And guys, again, if you haven't read the book, pick that up. Just blow it up. Fire power for living an unlimited life. I will link this. I will link up your website, the book, everything, uh, your social media links. Dixie, I certainly appreciate your time today. Oh, I've enjoyed it. No end. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Bye-bye. You know, the world needs you. So don't underestimate your greatness. If you like today's episode, you can spread the word by using the share buttons on the side. And if you want to learn how to simplify your life and your business, join the community and get our free updates directly to your inbox.